Welcome to the uh, first series, or the first reading in our YAWP series, what we call the YAWP series. Uh, I believe the subtitle is an open dialogue on creativity and the arts. So the idea is that the poet will read some poems. Um, he's going to be reading from his last book, <laughs> Bone Shepherds, as well as some new work, I'm sure, uh, which all the uh, advanced poetry students in the room have read. And then we're going to have a brief Q&A, maybe about 10, 15 minutes, in which you can engage in that open dialogue on the arts that the subtitle promises you. So I hope you've come prepared with some scintillating and possibly deeply probing personal questions, which I'm sure he'll be happy to answer. Um, thanks to all of you who didn't come here for extra credit or because you were required. I think that's maybe like four of you, uh, including Gene <laughs> and the cameraman. Uh, maybe there's two other. Oh, there's another person. <laughs> so you, of all people, should be most commended for coming out on a freezing cold night in Quinnipiac. Um, I'm excited to have Patrick Rosal here. He's uh, a poet that I actually just came to know fairly recently, uh, within I think the last couple of years. Some of you may remember John Murillo, who came here, was that two years ago? It seems like it was 10 years ago. Uh, fantastic young poet, um, John Murillo came here, and we, on the right back we were talking about uh, Asian American poets, specifically Asian American male poets, which if you don't know, there are very few of us in this country, at least that anyone knows about, including Asian American men, like myself. So I was asking John, I was like, do you know any other Asian American men besides me and like Lee Young Lee? And uh, he's like, actually, I know this guy, Patrick Rosal, that you may not have heard of. Uh, he's a really good friend of mine, and he's one of the best readers of poetry, aside from just being a good poet uh, that I know. So you should definitely have him out there. So after that, I looked up Patrick, really liked his work, and then I invited him to read in Brooklyn, I think it was like last summer or two summers ago. And it is true, not only is he a damn good poet, but he is a, an electrifying reader of his poetry, one of the best uh, readers that I've ever heard. Not to build him up too much in your heads before he's about to take the stage, but uh, be prepared to be excited. Um, a little bit about his bio. Aside from Bone Shepherds, he's also the author of two other books. His first book is called Up Rock, Headspin, Scramble, and Dive, winner of the Member's Choice Award from the Asian American Writers Workshop, and My American Kundiman, winner of the Global Filipino Literary Award, and the 2006 Book Award in Poetry from the Association of Asian American Studies. And I think he lives now in Jersey, right? He's, oh, sorry, Philadelphia. Oh, you're in Philly. But you teach at Rutgers, right? Oh, okay. Geographical lesson as well for you today, which I, I didn't realize Philly was so close to Jersey. Uh, but please put your hands together and give Patrick Rosell a, a warm Quinnipiac welcome. Thank you. How many of you get into New York pretty often? So this new book is a lot about, um, um, it's about New York City and a little bit about Philadelphia, but I lived in New York for about seven or eight years. I lived in North Jersey my entire life. So it's a city I was in and out of for a long time. This is kind of my farewell love note to Brooklyn. Um, my family history also runs through Brooklyn. My dad moved there in 1962, 1963. So a lot of these poems take place in, uh, in New York City. This is called At the Tribunals and uh, it takes place in the Lower East Side. At the tribunals. <laughs> Once, in a brawl on Orchard, I clocked a kid with a ridge hand so hard I could feel his top teeth give. His knees buckled and my homeboy let loose a one-two to finish the job. I turned around to block a sucker punch that didn't come. We ducked under the cops' bright red hatchets that swung around the corner. I never saw the first kid drop. He must have been still falling when I dipped from the scene and trotted toward Delancey. He was falling when I stopped to check my leather for scuff marks. He was falling when I slipped inside a dive to hide from a girl who got ghost for books. He was falling when I kissed the Santo Nino's white feet and Melanie's left collarbone and the forehead of one punk whose nose I busted for nothing but squaring off with me. His head snapped back to show his neck's smooth pelt. Look away long enough and a boy can fall for weeks, decades, even as you get down on one knee to pray the rotting kidneys in your mom's gut don't turn too quick to stone. I didn't stick around to watch my own work. I didn't wait for a single body to hit the pavement. In those days, it was always spring and I was mostly made of knives. I rolled 22 deep 
Every one of us lulled by a blade, though few of us knew the steel note that chimed a full measure if you slid the edge along around to make it keen. I'll tell those stiffs in frocks to go ahead and count me among the ones who made nothing good with his bare hands. I'll confess, I love the wreckage, no matter the country, no matter the machine. I was gonna start this shit off a lot more fun, but damn, I couldn't find it. If I can find it, I'm gonna do it. I was just, Rachel, thank you for the ride. <laughs> We're talking a little bit about Dead Mouse on the way here. Any Dead Mouse fans? I used to DJ, like back in the day, DJ, like 19, 1984, 1985 DJs. Like analog, vinyl DJ, like. The buzz in the ground could fuck up a party, DJ. <laughs> we had two turntables, and uh, matter of fact, um, you know, to battle, you really needed Techniques 1200s. Those were the fancy, those were the fancy, somebody's not, not in their head. Those were the fancy turntables, but they were so expensive. So we get these bootleg, <laughs> we get these bootleg SLBD1 Technique tables from uh, Sam Goody. <laughs> I know they had Sam Goody up here in, in Connecticut. It's like an electronics store. And we used to buy these bootleg turntables and we used to turn them into Techniques 1200s from parts of uh, other DJ equipment that people threw away, you know? And uh, this whole remix culture that's happening now, um, it's interesting to me to watch it erase the ways in which people of color and hip hop innovated so much of, of what remix culture is right now. Um, so this is a scavenger, it's called a scavenger's ode uh, to the turntable, a.k.a. a note to Thomas Alva Edison. But I need a little bit of help. We'll do a little, uh, we'll do a little call and response. Can you do it? Yeah. See, that already sucks. <laughs> Can you do it? Yeah. When I say Mike, you say nice. Mike? Nice. When I say set, you say yes. Set? Yes. Mike? Nice. Set? Yes. A two turntables and a mic. Nice. Oh, wait. I got confused. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> At least she was honest. <laughs> <laughs> two turntables and a mic. Nice. A one fat MC on a set. Yes. A two turntables and a mic. Nice. A one fat MC on a set. Yes. We lifted the precious arm first, then the platter. We pulled free the belt and unscrewed the top. I didn't take shop or build a whole lot by hand, but I was pretty good with a knife. I poked the half-dull blade clean and gentle through the turntable's plastic. I sawed down four inches straight as I could make it. Me and my boys, sons of cops, bookkeepers, and ex-priests, picked up gear other DJs didn't want no more. One prep school kid who just bought a shiny new mixer tossed out his two-month-old Newmark, which we picked out the garbage and hoisted home. We harvested the slider from the rich kid's rig. I stripped the wire's tips and soldered them to pitch contacts in the basement of a maple split in Edison, New Jersey. We were learning to turn anything into anything else. While our mothers played mahjong in the sala and our fathers bet slow horses and the government bombed Iraq, we learned to poise pennies on the cartridge head so the diamond stylus would sit deep in the vinyl's groove. A dance floor could turn from whining to riot quick if a record skipped when we spun back the wax to its cue. We stayed awake from noon to noon, digging out from the crate some forgotten voice or violin to scratch. We juggled and chirped. We perfected the grind of a downbeat and dropped it on the bass line coming round, half trash, half hallelujah, our hands cut back to bambata and made a dance hall jump. We held one ear to the syncopated kick and the other to a future music that no one else could hear. Out of a hunk of rescued junk, we built a machine to mix our masters. We faded and transformed. We chopped up classics and made the whole block bounce. A two turntables and a mic. Nice. A one fat MC on a set. Yes. A two turntables and a mic. Nice. A one fat MC on a set. Yes. 
When I say might, you say nice. Might. Nice. Set. Yes. Mike. Nice. Set. Yes. A two turntables and a mic. Nice. A one fat MC on the set. Yes. A two turntables and a mic. Nice. A one fat MC on the set. Yes. A two turntables, one fat MC. A two turntables and a mic. Nice. A one fat MC on the set. Yes. All right, I'll give it to you. <laughs> Oh, no kidding. Yeah. This weekend? Uh, Tonight? Oh, I was going to say, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Little man with fast hands. <clears throat> the sweat flicks from your elbows when you deliver the sweet no look to the big man on the wing. You've been running whole crews since noon. It's a hard country, 90 feet long and 50 feet wide, and everyone on the borders wants in. And no one belongs for more than 48 minutes at a time. You know most all the players' names, some you named yourself. You know in a half-court set how to pick a crossover from a point guard's hip and when to talk shit to the seven-footer who dumped on you last week hard. They know you'll chase down the lead man on a fast break and eat gravel just to make sure the young gun with the swift first step is the only one not smiling when the two of you square off next time. You know how to box out a stocky forward on the inside with a slick hip pull so the ref can't see. You are a little man with fast hands. Come from a long line of stealth and flash like the Filipino scout who scaled solo the sheer face of a mountain with nothing but a bolo blade in his teeth to reach a small squad of slumbering Japanese soldiers in a cave camped out. The scout slit the necks of 14 without waking them. He let the 15th sleep. This is just ball, but you know what's up. Our hands are quick, the history is deep. Tamarind. Yeah! Wow. <coughs> That's like the closest I'll ever get to Prince. <laughs> Tamarind. So some of these, some of these poems um, take place in the Philippines because I, I had a chance to go to the Philippines a few times actually in the last six, maybe almost eight years or so, I've been going back and forth um, almost every other year or every three years. And uh, I, I didn't, I went once when I was like 14, and then I got to go a bunch of times since I was, I started going back when I was like 38. Um, and this is uh, me picking, anybody know what tamarinds look like? They're like, if you go to, they have them in Whole Foods, right? You know what they look like. They look like shit. They, <laughs> they look like dog duty, the, the pods, right? <laughs> if you dry them, they really look like doo doo. Anyway, that's not what this poem is about. <laughs> but it's out about us picking fresh tamarind from the tree. And my, uh, this particular cousin had, j not just, but he had been out of jail um, for a murder that he had committed. Tamarind. This morning, my cousin Joseph and I both stink from drinking too much the night before, pumping into a karaoke machine enough coins to make wages for one family's week and a half of work. In this country, you don't have to walk too far or listen too hard to hear such miserable hymns. 10 years out of jail, Joseph has hands like twisted copper. He can go weeks without a razor to his face, tells me he half embraced the man he killed by cudgel during a drunken scuffle. Today, it's our job to fill a couple buckets with a few kilos of sour fruit we'll soak in vinegar, a remedy our uncles teach us to douse the thousand rum-sick monkeys howling between our ears. Lucky it's October, when one good rain can detonate from the smallest sprigs of the oldest tree on my uncle's farm, hundreds of swelled up tamarinds overnight. And those limbs weighed down will sag so low their tips will graze our thighs. 
half a year's worth of light stewed until a whole tree's acidic nectar turns to a sticky, thick bounty of fat husks. Even hungover, we can't contain ourselves. Hoarding with one hand, two and three tamarinds at a time. Joseph is humming some version of Sinatra when I drop my bucket to snatch one fruit twice the bulk of a big man's forefinger bulging off its branch. But the pod, which I barely pinch with three fingertips, bursts to dusty fog and a couple brown flakes clinging to the ruined fruit's few limp veins. What's more, the busted husk has unfurled a fine line of burgundy around my hand and wrist. Turns out a mass of ants has hollowed out the tamarind and left its dry, fragile husk intact until I crush it open and set loose a delicate rivulet of dark red running up my trigger finger and thumb, swarming now my wrist, splintering several swift paths around my elbow, a thin sleeve of fire writhing around my forearm. I stomp both feet hard to shake the critters free. Joseph by now has lost his mind laughing and I've lost all good sense too. I'm still brushing the last dozen and little beasts from my armpit when Joseph takes my hands in his and claps them as if that could make them clean. Today, I'm grateful to dance beneath a tamarind tree beside a two-bit assassin instead of the woman I adore. We will spill the tamarinds across a table and our aunts and uncles will break from work to join Joseph and me as we peel the fruit one by one, lick the drippings from between our fingers. We taste sap and salt in our own skin grit. We suck the fruit sour green pulp down to their smooth ruby hard pits. These seeds in our mouths click against our teeth before we spit them out and rattle them in our palms like so many muddy gems and so many bloody stones. Making love to you the night they take your father to prison. <coughs> You gotta get the sadness out somehow. Wait, what page is that? <laughs> you read it, see, you should read all the way through the book. It's towards the end. I kept it towards the end for a reason. They read the first half. Right. <laughs> all the fucking is at the end. <laughs> Making love to you. <laughs> Woo. Making love to you the night they take your father to prison. There's got to be a chorus somewhere for the conjunction of honeysuckle and funk. A verse for the turn of your hips and the sling back steel bar anthem banged out breathless over your father's small time underhand hustle. A tune that begins in the skin's hi-hat quiver begins with a lick of the fist or the thrum of a summer gust doubled in the brief sweet moan coaxed from your mouth and mine. We grind slow. Two bodies become one small song, scarcely loud enough to budge God and any three of his bloody saints. Baby, we are our own wine. We improvise the gorgeous toil, stillness, and motion against each other, make bone on blunt bone, gleefully barbaric, call it blessed. We cull something like salt out of the seep of evening air, immense and rising like incense, so stink hellfire must work twice as hard to burn it into us that once again back out. By dawn, you'll leave my finger between your teeth, and behind it, the last grief of the first man you've ever adored on the verge of free. Sometimes the body in music unlocks its most ruthless interrogatives and to this and the rest of the world tonight I cannot stop saying yes. Maybe I will read uh, maybe I'll read one more from uh, Bone Shepherds and then uh, maybe one from My American Kundiman, and then maybe I'll finish with one from, I don't know, either here or here. We'll figure it out. <laughs> I don't 
would like to read. Um, any uh, any MMA fans in here? None. <laughs> I'm the only beast in here that likes to watch dudes beat the shit out of each other? God. I'll read the poem anyway. So there was this league called Pride Fight before there was UFC, and there was no weight classes. So you could, uh, I know. That's what this poem is about. <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a, like you could basically have really huge dudes and really little dudes fight one another, you know? Um, I think that this is the first poem that has entered American literature about mixed martial arts. I'm pretty sure, actually. I'm proud of it. <laughs> Pride fight. <laughs> the 600-pound man and the 150-pound man squared off. And people have paid to see these two nudge each other blow by bloody blow or by submission as close as possible to death's front porch without sending the other man through that last gray door. We're yelling, fuck him up, oh shit, get out the way, smash him, though I don't know who I'm rooting for. I'm an American. I could want the pale runt to wreck the dark hulk to his knees, or cheer the giant as the pipsqueak darts around the ring to dodge his lumbering foe. The big man is casual, swipes a paw at the air and misses when the little man scuttles by. And this goes on for some time, the crowd jeering, no one in particular. We know, deep in our bodies, just about anything is grotesque if you make it large enough. Science says, in nature, all forms fail when you multiply them by scale. And in this near-death match, I wonder if what we're yelling at isn't a behemoth's bull rush toward this sack of taut scrawn, the farthest margins of all the gruesome multitudes each of us contains. On one end, all that is puny, a fragile and fleeting thrash of flesh. On the other, everything humongous and terrible, as if we could measure every catastrophe and rapture according to this exponential order. Dear audience. Perhaps if you're like me, you're asking, yeah, yeah, but who wins? And I'll tell you, it is the big man who catches the little man charging in. The big man falls full weight and smothers his rival whose face is smushed against a massive calf. Though the little man flaps and squirms, turns red, he manages from the bottom with both his legs to take hold of the big man's leg. The smaller man, struggling, tucks the one enormous foot in his armpit and with the might of every buck and a half of muscle in his body, arches his back and vice-like squeezes. If we thought the big man had one stoic face for the world. He shows us at least one other, and it is pain. The big man, sweaty and exhausted, his ankle about to snap, taps out. No one in or out of the ring exults. We are the ones who can't move. We fall into a moment of precise silence, as if we can't believe our eyes, as if we've just witnessed two men become exactly the size of ourselves. Maybe I'll just, one more? What do you think, Jason? Sure. Do one more. I think I'll do one from American Demon. 
How y'all doing? Two more? All right, I'll do two more. I'll do two from here. Thank you guys uh, for being awesome. Thank you for being awesome. <laughs> Kundiman on the dance floor called Guernica. Guernica was a club in like a little lounge in, uh, in the Lower East Side. And um, it's also the name of a place and a, one of Picasso's most famous paintings, right? Kundiman on a dance floor called Guernica. This woman and I are watching the b-boys contort cocksure swagger into dance, down to the very ligaments. Their bodies are wattage, their names writ in whiskey and smoke, their legs scribbling into the room's bone twilight, a gospel according to Duke. These dancers are thunder's bastards, and at the borders of their human maelstrom, a woman's hips are winding their own slow vortex between my hands. We twist time with our waists. Each sweat slick bass note hangs in the room like a heavy bruise, healing its way to another storm. I am losing my hands to her. I am learning to drown above water. But make no mistake, we think we are not in love, and no one can hear us. We are moaning for each other's air. One more. My little love song for New Jersey. <clears throat> Kundiman ending on a theme from Tila Rock. Your morning's everyday stained call of exhaust. Your plum bludgeon dusk, your fine stench and luckless French kiss. Your can I get down bliss. Your God gone, blessed Jones for loam. Your Jersey Baroque, your mercy nine sirens prying every sky. Your name, your flow, your funk, your everyday nasty. Your very revelry, your breakneck scat, the loot you boost. Your rags, your 7,000 island slang. Your hype, your hips, your spit, your sickest wit and snip. Your every severed syllable, your blunt tote fables. Your smoke's reprieve, your lever's torque bearing your body every day every lovely mucking hum your mic sound nice every check one your fade your cut your knife your jazz on two your bass your every cleft your left breast your folly your lung your modest rot your alibata tongue do you want it hell yeah baby because it's yours thank you very much About one more big round of applause for Patrick as well. So we have any questions? Sorry, man. Uh, I'm trying to ask. And uh, obviously the stage, but <laughs> oh. questions. Yes. When does the new look come out? <laughs> uh, sometime in 2016. I probably like the first three or four months of 2016. Yeah. Yes. Uh, oh, when you're writing poems, like, is it, is it usually, are you usually writing from your point of view, or do you sometimes like to choose someone else's point of view? Mostly the, like, these three books are mostly, and I guess even the, I guess even the new book are mostly in, they're mostly in first person. Um, I have some poems that are like, um, that are in third person or in persona, and I have some other things that I'm trying out that are in other point of view. I, I, I kind of like, are they from... Are they, are like in some poems, you're like taking a different character's point of view, even though you're still using I or? Yeah, yeah, there's a couple of, there's a couple in there. My American Kundiman, I, I write in the voice of the, of Lapu Lapu. Anybody know who Lapu Lapu is? Everybody knows who Magellan is, right? Yeah, yeah well, Lapu Lapu kicked the shit out of Magellan. <laughs> See, why would you know Magellan and not know the dude who kicked the shit out of Magellan? Magellan came to the Philippines to claim it for, the, for Spain, even though I think he was Portuguese or whatever, or he's Spanish and the Portuguese on it, whatever it was. He came and he thought he was gonna just snatch this island from Lapu Lapu, but Magellan fucked up. His boat like got wrecked on some reef and they had poison on their arrow tips and they he caught one. <laughs> anyway, so I speak in that guy's voice. <laughs> Any other questions? 
Yes. Um, okay, so when you're compiling a book and you you know you're like aiming towards that goal of having a collection, how often do you keep in mind like uh, kind of having a common like theme throughout, or do you just kind of write as you go and see what you have afterwards? It's it's that latter one. You know, like Robert Frost had said something like, I don't I can't remember the his, the exact number that he used, but he said if a if a if a uh, if a book is made of 20 poems, the 21st poem is the book. And so in the making of a poem, right, you're, you're writing trying to figure out what the, what the poem is about. In the making of a book, you're making the poems and you don't know what the book is yet. I think it's different now. I think a lot of people are like making projects. It's like, I'm going to, I'm going to write about skis and I have a whole, <laughs> collection of poems about different kinds of skis and that's my project. So before the even poems are, there's like a polyurethane poem and a ski pole poem. Before they're even written, he knows what those are. That's sort of antithetical to the way that I write, you know? I write, I write what's, I try to write what's urgent and what's bewildering and, and the, the, even with, I think this is true of all these books, but with this last book, I was putting all these poems together, like, what the fuck is this book about? <laughs> and I realized that I was having this hard time of letting go of New York City, and part of it was like, oh, it's about, it's about New York, and it's about crossing borders, and the history of crossing borders, and that Brooklyn itself is a site in which so many people have crossed in and out of. So, so for me, it's, it feels so important uh, to do that, Mostly because it's a delight. Like if anything else, the making of poems and the making of, book of, of books of poems should be delightful. Even when they're dark and difficult, there should be a kind of surprise and a kind of delightful bewilderment um, that's built into it. You know? And I don't think that you can do that if you know exactly what it's going to be from John. You know? How many of y'all write poems? How many of you read poems? So, I know who's here for extra credit. <laughs> Any others? Yeah. So you seem to find delight in a sort of carnage. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Like uh, it's it's just a violent book, and um, it's like violence, sex, and music. Um, what what do you think that? comes from. Rock and roll, dude! <laughs> America? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, I, that opening poem, I didn't read it. It's actually a difficult poem for me to read um, out loud. It's hard to perform. Um, but the, the Bone Shepherd's Lament, the title, the title poem, I read that up at, uh, up in Maine. And Quincy Troop, you guys know who Quincy Troop is? Amazing. He, you know, he co-wrote uh, Miles Davis' autobiography. I mean, a million. He's written a million books. And Quincy was up there. Quincy's a friend of mine. He was like, he was like, hey, that uh, <laughs> that uh, that Bone Shepherd's poem that you read, man. Did I, is, uh, is that published here? Or I won't publish it. I was like, no. I was like, oh no, no. I said, I said, yeah, 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 yeah. It's uh, it's gonna get picked up by this place out, out in Australia. He's like, of course, Australia. Ain't no American Journal gonna pick that poem up with all its dead goats and stuff like that. <laughs> You know, I think that there, there's a, a lot of American poetry that wants to deny the violence of, the, of this country. Um, I'm being a Filipino American, I've inherited so many different strands and traditions of violence. And, and this book was a real tough sort of um, effort. It was like, an, I was trying to look at that. I was trying to look at what did it mean to inherit so much violence from both sides, you know? Um, it felt like it was something that wasn't being talked about. I was, I mean, I was a Jersey kid growing up in the 70s and 80s. I got indoctrinated into that violence. This book is me examining the ways in which I got indoctrinated into that violence. And if you do get indoctrinated into something that is so destructive, is it possible to examine it through poetry and be changed by the process of examination? That was my question. 
Yeah. So your father moved to Brooklyn from the Philippines? Um, it was a little bit windy. He, he was in Chicago first, and then uh, he, that's where he met my mom. While he was in the priesthood, and he got her pregnant a couple of times. She went to Canada. They finally came back in Brooklyn, and yeah. <laughs> I know. I, this book is going to be fucking amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I was just wondering if, if he was in the Philippines during the 40s. Yes. Okay. Yeah, during the World War II, during yeah, World right. War II, right. And, and, you know, just before that, like, so we, re I think as Americans, if you remember the Philippines before Bruno Mars, uh, <laughs> yes, he <is>. he's half <laughs> Filipino, half Puerto Rican. He's, he's from Hawaii, but he's half Filipino, half Puerto Rican. Um, if you remember, the, if you know anything about the Philippines, and it's likely that you don't, because essentially it's been erased from history books, it was, it was it, an essential piece of policy making for half a century, for the whole first half of the 20th century. So you look at head headline after headline is about whether or not the United States should give the Philippines its independence, right? You look at, you look at the cartoons from 1899 to 1906 and we're, we're portrayed like pickaninnies, big lips, you know, oversized heads, like savages, a, a lot of way the pickaninnies are, are, are are, are, uh, are portrayed, right? And it was, a, it was a way to justify taking over the country because what was being said publicly was that, oh, they're not prepared to govern themselves, even though they had been westernized for 300 years by Spain. There were Filipinos who were uh, put on display at the St. Louis World's Fair. They were the biggest exhibit in 1904 the most lucrative exhibit in the, in, in the St. Louis Fair, and they were put on exhibit like savages, just with loincloths. Some of them were engineers, but they were forced to dress like that in order to reinforce a narrative about what kind of, what kind of people. For 50 years, this was the narrative. You get to 1950, boom, it's not in the history books. We never colonized the archipelago, right? The, we're, there's a lot of talk right now about um, black violence or, or violence against, against black folks, that narrative is so deeply embedded in the relationship between the <coughs> Philippines and black folks. I mean, I could go give a whole lecture on the Buffalo soldiers who went to the Philippines, right? Um, but that whole narrative, <coughs> gone. We're going to spend at least the next half century, maybe century, trying to restore that story. That's why they took it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a way to, it's sort of a way to, way to, way to protect one's national image, right? And uh, exceptionalism. I was going to ask a question sort yeah. of about that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this. Uh, but thinking of all that and the way that uh, Americans <coughs> are perceived, and then specifically Filipino Americans, and that even. Uh, more specific, as a male, uh, how conscious are you as a writer, just as a person of embodying, I can see especially the way you perform, like embodying a kind of like joyful, physical uh, human being that enjoys sex, <laughs> and thinks of himself as a sexual being, uh, recognizes a history that other people perhaps are not aware of, like how conscious of you are of just bringing that into a visibility that doesn't really exist yet. I'm real conscious of it, because I'm, I'm pissed off about it, you know? I mean, I'm not saying this to, to like, I'm not saying this to brag or anything like this, but it's, it's interesting what happened. I started, I don't know how to say it, I'm going to say it in the vernacular, but I, used to, I started messing with girls real young. When I was like 12 years old, I started messing with girls. And I'm not talking about just like pecking girls on the cheek. I was messing with girls. Like I got in freshman year. I remember this distinctly. I was sitting in the cafeteria, and, and um, David Hickey was like, He's like, he's like, you've never seen a vagina. And I just shut up. And I was like, it's not that I should have. It's not that it's, it makes me a, ma a man that I am. But there was, this, there was this certainty and refusal of my sexuality at that moment that continued and continues now for the next 30, 35 years. And it's like, how... How, what, what are the, con what's the construction in this culture where I walk down the street and, you know, 
a kind of sexual narrative can already be can already be assigned to me. This is why I can I can I feel like I can identify with with a feminist project or a queer project because I get it. Like having your body's narrative being told for you is it's a painful it's a painful thing. You know, you end up you end up stifling a lot of things inside. Got a question? Maybe not. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yes. I have two sort of related questions. You write really strongly rhythmic poetry, and I wonder if you're aware of writing in any particular rhythms. And then, related to that, when you perform it, how did you develop your performance? And it also is very rhythmic. So. I, uh, I'm, a, I'm aware of it. I mean, sort of, if I was, if I was to boil down a kind of my, uh, my line by line craft, I just try to cut out as many unstressed syllables as I can from a line. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say it sounded like um, sprung rhythm. Hopkins is huge for me, yeah. you know? Yeah. And um, the difference between me and Hopkins is like Hopkins doesn't give a damn if it approaches normal speech. <laughs> he was, he's talking about God and shit. So, <laughs> so it's okay if it's like this elevated, this highly elevated thing. And I think that I can, I can move into that elevation, but I. Um, <clears throat> But I'm conscious of you know his sort of his sprung rhythm line, um, and I'll tell you what like having that having that percussive line makes the performance a lot easier. I think the better crafted a poem is, the easier you make it for yourself as a performer as a reader. It's like the I think that the one of the misconceptions is oh he's a great reader, his poems sound great because he's a great reader. Really, if, it's a gr if it sounds great and the poem is shitty, he's working 17 times harder than he has to, to work because the poem could be a lot better and he could just be feeling it. I, I have a deep belief that the line, the rhythm of the line of a poem, it's really in your body, you know? It's you can feel it in your body as a performer. If I could feel it in my body as a performer, I got a better chance at making you feel it as, a, as an audience member. So when I, when I think about my poetics both on the page, or when I think about my poetics on the page, it's tied to what I'm doing in terms of my body. Maybe one more? Um, when you're, I know that like most people, just as a poet myself, there are a lot of people that feel, I don't know, some, somehow they just feel intimidated by poets who project very loudly, who can, like you said, feel the poem through their body. And like, have you, have you ever gotten that? And like, how did you feel? Like when, like when you know the audience is standing there like, oh my gosh, that was so <laughs> Like, That's a great question. I don't think that, that's such a good question. I'm, I'm going to say something, and I don't know if it's true, but I, and maybe it sounds a little bit corny, but I, at, at, the, at the base of everything I write and everything I perform is love. Everything. Like, I'm trying to get at some quality of love in the line, in the diction, in the poem, in its vertical rhythm. And so, if they're getting intimidated, I'm wondering... I'm wondering how that, like if somebody came up to me and said that, I find your poems intimidating. I think I don't, that's never happened. I think that, it, that it's never happened. Yeah, no, no. I think too, like every poem, I, I, try, I try, to, try to make myself as visible and as vulnerable as any other subject that's in the poem. It doesn't feel, it, there's, something, there's something in the ethics of my, of my observation as a poet that requires me to make myself as vulnerable as almost anything that's inside of the poem. And I, I think that would be hard to intimidate people if what I'm doing is looking, trying to excavate something from myself first. That's like James Baldwin, you know? So we have to, we have to find the real struggle inside of our, our own hearts, and I think you know, I think that I've had sort of antagonistic relationships with audiences before, <laughs> but they just walk out. <laughs>
And then I find people whom I love and people who love me and people who can recognize the love that's encoded in the things that I'm doing. And that's the thing that keeps me going. All right. All right. Let's get back